<laughs> Welcome to the museum. Your Simi Valley, Simi Valley. Your Fort Wayne Historical Society Museum. I was just thinking of the guy who's going to be speaking next in Simi Valley. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. How many of you are here for the very first time? Raise your hand. Welcome, and I hope you will come back. Um, we have these distinguished speakers every, just about every week, or every uh, other week during the, uh, the year. And they're always historical, and they're always really good. So I'm glad that you came. Today is very special, and I will tell you more about what happens uh, with our next speakers um, after this whole thing is over. So for right now, I'm going to set the stage. Welcome to radio station W. C.O.R. New York. It's October 14, 1948. Today's scheduled live show was a discussion between the daughters of Supreme Court Justice Louis D. Brandeis. Unfortunately, Elizabeth Brandeis is not able to be with us today, so Susan Brandeis will present alone for the family. We are privileged today to be part of the live audience at station WCOR. Please enjoy the story of Louis D. Brandeis and family in 1948. Well, I would like to thank radio station WCOR New York for inviting me to join, um, supposedly with my sister, but to tell you about my father, Louis D. Brandeis. Two years ago, on July 16, 1946, a former medical student uh, in school, Middlesex University, was purchased and renamed Brandeis University after my father, the first Jewish Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Middlesex University was the only medical school in the U.S. that didn't have a quota limiting the number of Jewish students. The advantages of the university are its size, 100 acres and location, just nine miles north of Boston. The emphasis is on academic excellence, research, and social justice. My father would approve. Today, October 14, 1948, the university enrolled its first class. Well, before I continue, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Susan Brandeis Gilbert. I followed the family tradition and went to law school. Now, I applied to Harvard, and although my father had graduated at the top of his class, the university did not accept female applicants back in 1915. However, the University of Chicago Law School did, and so I enrolled there. Well, did you know that when I graduated law school and passed the bar, I couldn't vote? <laughs> my entire family joined the women's suffrage movement, including my father. Thank goodness for the 19th Amendment in 1920. Well, after graduation, no law firm would hire me. I eventually found a partner, Samuel Rosenman. One of our cases was a minor tenant landlord suit. I lost the case, but I did gain a husband, <clears throat> the opposition attorney, Jacob Gilbert. And we're now partners in the firm Gilbert and Brandeis. Being a liberated woman, ladies first didn't pertain. We have three grown children, Louis, Alice, and Frank. Louis was the first grandchild, and so Dad dubbed him the Crown Prince, or CP. <laughs> My sister, who couldn't be here today and really wanted to be, is Elizabeth Brandeis Rauschenbusch. Um, she attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison and became a professor of economics there. She married Paul Rauschenbusch, who is also an economist. They specialize in labor legislation and on such subjects as wages and hours, and they fought for unemployment insurance. <clears throat> Our family roots go back to Prague, Bohemia, which is now Czechoslovakia. Our parents and extended family left for the United States in the 1800s to escape political turmoil and anti-Semitism. They settled in Louisville, Kentucky, where Grandpa set up a wholesale grain business. They had four children, two girls and two boys. Dad was the youngest. He was born in 1856 and remembered helping
helping his mother serve food and water to the Union troops when he was six years old. Dad was an outstanding student. Unfortunately, though, he had to leave school in 1870 because there was a depression similar to the stock market crash in 1929. Grandpa had to close down the grain business and the whole family traveled to Europe for three years. Well, Dad decided to enroll in a school in Dresden, Germany, as he was fluent in German. Back then, documentation was much less formal than it is today. <laughs> well, I remember he told us a story about the headmaster who asked, where is your birth certificate? And Dad replied, here I am. <laughs> and then the headmaster said, well, show me your vaccination certificate. And Dad said, look at my arm. <laughs> he was an honor student there for three years. When the family returned to the United States, Dad applied to Harvard University, the law school there. Oh, he was accepted as a miracle. He didn't even attend college. Dad easily passed the entrance exams, though, and he impressed the law professors with his brilliant mind. He wrote to our Uncle Otto, I am pleased with anything pertaining to the law. When he graduated at the age of 21, he was the first in his class. Dad eventually joined his Harvard friend, Samuel Warren, establishing a law practice in Boston. Warren came from a wealthy family with wealthy friends. Now these wealthy clients made Dad a rich man, so rich that the firm hired more lawyers and secretaries. Grandma had instilled in her children the importance of helping those in need, so he decided to do pro bono work, offering free legal help. My mother is Alice Brandeis. Our mom and dad were second cousins, and they met at the home of mutual relatives. They married in 1891. Dad considered her his soulmate, and they both agreed to live frugally, sharing their wealth and success with those less fortunate. Well, that is relatively speaking. Uh, Mom and Dad bought a vacation home in Chatham on Cape Cod, which is still in our family today. Dad enjoyed canoeing and hiking with us, but he didn't buy a yacht, as his wealthy friends did. Mom's family were also intellectual and brilliant. Her uncle, Louis Dembitz, was an attorney and read in 12 languages. Her father, Joseph Goldmark, was a physician and a scientist. Uncle Carl Goldmark was a famous composer, and <laughs> Uncle Henry Goldmark designed and installed the locks in the Panama Canal. He was there for seven years overseeing the project. Well, my father made many long-lasting contributions to the law and social reform. He recognized that monopolies were widening the gap between the powerful and the powerless. I'm sure that many of our listeners today have parents and grandparents who were born in Europe and traveled by ship to America, as our grandparents did. Many immigrants were poor, often living in tenements and working in sweatshops. Dad tried to help those in need. He realized that the printed word could be used to publicize the plight of the powerless. He wrote articles for newspapers and magazines. He wrote about the curse of bigness in banking, mega banks risking other people's money for investments. In 1914, his articles were published in a book called Other People's Money and How Bankers Use It. And it's still in print today. Well, you all know what happened in 1929, and then just 13 years ago, 1935, was when Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act to prevent savings banks from engaging in these risky investments. Dad was always a champion of the poor, and there were plenty of poor people struggling to survive. There was a home for paupers on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. The food was barely edible, and the donated clothes were nothing more than rags. Dad set up meetings with city officials to publicize the situation. Some improvements were made, but the causes of poverty were not discussed. Do any of you remember reading about the Homestead, Pennsylvania strike of 1892? <laughs> well, our family read about it and discussed it. The Carnegie Steel Corporation workers went on strike. The governor sent 8,000 troops to quell the strike amidst all the violence. 
Dad told us that he was shocked. It wasn't until 1935 that the Wagner Act, um, when unions finally gained the right to organize into trade unions. Dad also devised peaceful solutions to the insurance scandal. Some directors used funds, insurance funds, for parties and personal expenses. One party alone cost $200,000. I know of four people who lost their life insurance policy because they missed one payment. One writer called the insurance company practices a legal racket to steal from the poor. Incredibly, 40 cents on each dollar collected was for company expenses. As usual, Dad, in his thoughtful way, did research on the problem and devised solutions such as disclosure of financial statements and no money to be used for private expenses. Dad opposed inequities in the railroad industry too. Even today in 1948, that industry is among the most powerful interest groups in Washington. In 1860, when Dad was a small child, there were only 30,000 miles of track in the United States. Well, by uh, 1910, there were 250,000 miles of railroad, more than the rest of the world combined. Dad fought against mergers that would restrict competition, although he didn't always win. He was also concerned with abuses toward women, children, and immigrants. I recall one of the cases that Dad won in 1908. It involved maximum hours for women working in laundries. He studied the effect of the long work days on women, and he found that their health and welfare of their families was adversely affected. From his research, he wrote up a report called the Brandeis Brief, and this document set up a legal precedent. Scientific and social research could now be used as evidence. Sadly, child labor laws did not fare so well. The first few attempts to regulate child labor failed. And finally, in 1941, the year of Dad's passing, the court upheld a child labor law. Now, speaking of the rights of women in the workplace, I was just starting college in 1911 when a terrible tragedy took place in New York City. A fire broke out at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. The workers, mostly young immigrant women, could not escape because the doors were locked on each floor. As a result, 146 people died. Dad helped to settle disputes between manufacturers and labor, but the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory refused to participate in a settlement. While Dad fought for the rights of the poor here in the United States, the Jews in Eastern Europe were suffering too. Dad realized that they needed a national homeland. And with the onset of World War I, the European Jews could not help with the Zionist movement anymore. At that point, Dad became a Zionist leader himself. He supported Henrietta Zoll, the founder of the Hadassah and the Hadassah Hospital, with his own contributions of $50,000. We have photos of Dad's visit to Palestine in 1919. The settlers greeted him warmly Eventually, they set up a kibbutz called Ein HaShofet, meaning Well of the Judge, in honor of Dad. I was in law school when Dad was nominated by President Woodrow Wilson to the U.S. Supreme Court as Associate Justice in 1916. Well, for years, he had been an advisor to Wilson. In fact, Wilson initially wanted him to be a member of his cabinet. <laughs> what a commotion that caused. Dad was called a radical, even though he was an economic conservative. You have to understand, he was a social reformer and a Jew, and it was 1916. There was also <coughs> quite a commotion caused by the Supreme Court nomination. The newspapers were very critical of him. The LA Times called him offensive to every patriot. And the Wall Street Journal said that he was an anti-corporation agitator. It took six months for Congress to finally approve his nomination, and he became the first Jewish justice of the United States Supreme Court. Dad and his colleague on the Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., supported free speech. 
<laughs> that was a very controversial issue in 1918. You see, with uh, World War I resulted in <clears throat> suspicions of foreign-born Americans, members of subversive organizations, union leaders, and even entertainers. One film producer of a documentary about the Revolutionary War was convicted and sent to jail. Why? Because he had the audacity to portray England, which was our ally in World War I, as the enemy during the Revolutionary War. <laughs> oh, then there was the Anita Whitney case. That was in 1926. Anita was convicted in the California court for membership in subversive groups like the Communist Labor Party. She joined the party loudly protesting against income inequality. The case eventually reached the Supreme Court. Dad joined the other justices in upholding the conviction of Anita Whitney since she did violate California law. However, he believed that the law suppressing freedom of speech should be overturned. Dad wrote was what was called a concurrence, considered one of the best defenses of free speech in the history of the US legal system. Thanks to the Brandeis concurrence, as well as many letters in defense of Miss Whitney, the governor of California granted her a pardon. Now, <clears throat> let's return to the unions, which is my sister's area of expertise. Dad supported the unions as long as they acted responsibly. He also supported employers as long as they also acted responsibly. Changes in attitudes toward unions shifted during the FDR administration. As a Supreme Court Justice, Dad championed so many causes that are still important to us in 1948. Individual liberties, freedom of speech, right to privacy, labor and antitrust laws, due process and equal protection under the law. A big concern of his, which we still deal with today, is income inequality. Dad was on the Supreme Court for 23 years. One important area that the court did not deal with sufficiently was civil rights. Lynchings are still taking place, mainly in the South. Even today, in 1948, people of color are still suffering under Jim Crow laws, separation of the races in schools, restaurants, and other public places. Those Jim Crow laws were legalized as a result of the disgraceful, separate, but equal Supreme Court decision of 1894 which was before our father's time on the court. Dad was sympathetic to the goals of the NAACP, which was founded in 1909. He encouraged attorney Felix Frankfurter, later a Supreme Court judge himself, to assist those with legal uh, services. And he did that for 10 years, pro bono. Have you ever wondered if our country will ever achieve equality for all? Well, when Dad retired from the court in 1939, he received many, many accommodations. Albert Einstein wrote, true human progress is based less on the inventive nine than on the conscience of men such as Brandeis. At the same time, however, Hitler was making plans to rid Germany and the rest of Europe of Jews. And Britain closed the doors to Jewish immigration to Palestine. Dad told us that the Jews must leave Germany. The realization of the horrible events in Eastern Europe was so painful for him. After all, he was an admirer of German culture. He attended school there, and he spoke German fluently. The rise in anti-Semitism in America was also painful for him, as for all of us. On the home front, Dad and Mom continued to have weekly at-homes, where they invited friends for afternoon tea. The group was quite diverse, politicians, writers, students, Zionists, social workers, professors, lawyers, and biologists. I remember one special guest who our listeners may have heard of, Lillian Gilbreth. She and her husband, Frank, were the subject of this year's bestseller, Cheaper by the Dozen. Lillian was the first working female engineer and psychologist with a PhD. By using efficiency strategies, she could manage a family of 12 children and still work outside the home. 
any woman who deserves that, uh, who, who can be that efficient, deserves kudos, in my opinion. Well, Lillian and Frank consulted with large companies to improve efficiency in the workplace. Now, I hear that the book's going to be made into a movie in the near future. The rumor is that Clifton Webb and Myrna Loy will star in the picture. Mom was always a gracious hostess, and Dad kept in touch with family, friends, and associates. Our family, especially Dad, wrote letters regularly. He always encouraged us to be the best that we could be. You couldn't imagine a more loving father. I have a letter from him dated April 24th, 1913, while I was an undergraduate at Bryn Mawr. Dearest Susan, I have no doubt that you will, in due time, have plenty to say, and that what you say will be worthwhile, because what you do is high-minded and noble. Dad has left our family and our country with quite a legacy. He contributed about one and a half million dollars to charity, supported the University of Louisville, supported the Zionist movement, worked pro bono for social reforms, and contributed to our legal system. His law office is still in existence and still doing pro bono work. My sister and I are so proud that this new university bears our father's name. We know that it will become one of the most prominent institutions of higher education in our country. I thank radio station WCOR for inviting me to share my memories and celebrate the opening of Brandeis University. Thank you. Presentations, historic fashion consulting, and community events. She has a collection of historical characters that she has researched and portrays in costume. Connie is a docent at Heritage Square and the Channel Islands Maritime Museum in Oxnard, as well as the Dudley House in Vancouver. And I think we should give her some more. Thank you. We have something for you. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. I will share it with Diane. So she is the the woman behind this program. She is playing the piano. What a wonderful addition. Do you have any questions for our presenter? That's really good because <laughs> Diane's the expert, and in in the book that that she's writing, the twenty five biographies. Of course, you know Brandeis is is one of the biographies. So, question? No, it's more of a comment. Yes. I just want to say this is not the first time I've, I've heard you perform, Connie, and you're an excellent man. Oh, really, thank really you. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I had to do a lot of quick revisions this morning <laughs> to, to make up for two people instead of one. A branch of the university or a branch of the club, the Brandeis? Okay. No, 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 it's the university. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because there are clubs, Brandeis clubs, throughout. There's one, in, there's a few in um, Camarillo um, and in uh, Thousand Oaks, and I think there's one in Ventura. And those are, it's um, women and, and men club, the couple, singles who get together in, um, in, in the name of Brandeis and they, they have regular meetings and fundraisers and they contribute to the university. 
Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is a kind an actual, like a satellite. And I happen to be very uh, fortunate to have a, a very close friend who was a librarian at Brandeis. Her name is Hannah Kuhn. And so she she would also would have loved to see her presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. any other questions? Okay, next week. Before you go on, can I just say a little bit about my stuff here? Sure. Okay. Only because while we're still on this. So um, I brought with me, um, since I am kind of representing my different museums, so I brought a brochure from Heritage Square and one from Channel Islands Maritime Museum. And I don't know if you have um, these here, but did you know that there are 32 museums and 33 museums oh, yeah. here? Oh, I thought you guys were on here. Right. No, we're not on okay. Um, here in Ventura County, and this is a wonderful little brochure. People are always saying get rid of paper, but you know I love brochure paper. And there's a map back here, so there's there's lots to do when you have people come and visit. And then lastly, for about me, these I did not put back on the table. But if anyone is interested, as Beverly mentioned, I do have quite a collection of characters that I play. In fact, there's 23 different shows here, including Mrs. Claus. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, there's a, if anybody's interested, I have these, and I left my card on the table back there. So, thanks, Bill. Sure. Right. Thank you. Next week we will not be having a speaker, but the following week, which is I think in September, we will have Kurt Osterhout, who is uh, one of the docents at the Simi. That's right, right, Simi Valley uh, Railroad Station. And he's going to be able to tell you about the history of that museum, which is one of the first ones that came up in um, Ventura County. And if you want to sign up for any of the tours, we still have uh, places available. We go to the harbor, do a tour of the harbor. When is it? Every third, third Friday of the month. And then, of course, during the Banana Fest, uh, there will be tours of the harbor as well. Banana Fest is September 29th or something like that. That weekend, that Saturday. Okay, any other questions or comments? I'm going to pass the hat. We don't get um, very much money from the city. We just get the lights and the water. So we always just pass the hat. As the steward moves you, go ahead. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming. I know you really enjoyed it. Yeah. There are treats back there uh, that Penny makes every week, and her brochures are right next to the treats.